Ryan, what other cytogenetic abnormalities do you watch for, worry about uh, in uh, newly diagnosed ALL patients? Yeah, there's, there's certainly some that I, I keep an eye out for that I think do have uh, important prognostic features, though I'll admit um, the, the likelihood that they independently would change my management uh, is probably less than, certainly less than the Philadelphia chromosome. So for example, uh, high risk features that uh, have borne out in terms of cytogenetic abnormalities, uh, in adults at least, things like complex karyotypes, uh, hypodiploidy, um, uh, less, dis less well described in adults, but certainly in pediatrics or the uh, intrachromosomal amplification of chromosome 21. That's a relatively rare finding, but uh, associated with relatively poor outcomes. So when I see these abnormalities in the, in the cytogenetic reports that I get back, at least in my practice, I'm not typically changing anything about their treatment up front, but I've certainly got my antenna up about you know, keeping a really close eye on their response to therapy, maybe being a little bit more diligent about proactively thinking about stem cell transplantation. But for some of these abnormalities, at least my, my take on the data and my own clinical practice, if, if some of these higher risk features, if, if, if for the lucky subset of those that have a really good response to treatment and sort of meet those milestones of early MRD negativity and so forth, I'm usually still continuing on with chemotherapy and not referring them for transplant up front based solely on those those abnormalities. Ryan, are there data to support that patients in those poor risk categories benefit from transplant? Um, not, not necessarily. Um, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with uh, some of the studies that just came out of, I think it was the COG and also uh, St. Jude's looking at the lack of benefit of transplant and hypodiploid ALL. Um, and I think that's one thing I really struggle with personally is that we, you know, allogeneic transplantation is a relatively blunt instrument. And um, oftentimes it's, it, it's relatively safe to sort of jump to the conclusion that a high risk hematologic malignancy transplant is what we should do. <laughs> uh, but the reality is for some of these subtypes, we don't really know that it's gonna be helpful. And I think studies like that kind of help demonstrate examples of, you know, just because it's a high risk disease doesn't necessarily mean that transplant's gonna be a better option, but the reality is, particularly in adult ALL, where uh, salvaging these patients when they do relapse is a lot more challenging, we often will err on the side of over-treating with the hope being that we'll at least, you know, save a few of those relapses. But I think that's really the quick question. We don't really have much data for, you know, the, um, for this 411 translocation with hypodeployed yeah. patients that who do achieve, and they're usually MRD positive, but if they're lucky enough to get early MRD negative, are they really high risk anymore? I mean, it used to be high risk based on before the MRD was fully incorporated, before the era of the MRD-directed therapy. So now with this great, you know, the better therapies that we have, we used to be high risk, just like Philadelphia chromosome, we used to be transplanting most of these patients, but really moved away from it because now we have a better therapy. So I think these are the, you know, the uh, kind of the uh, uh, unanswered questions that is kind of struggle that when I see MRD negativity, should I be transplanting those patients, younger patients, I agree that we probably tend to overdo a little bit. Um, the lack of data, I'm not quite convinced that transplant is really the answer for these patients will help most of these patients. But again, we really don't have a clear data, so it makes it very challenging. For the, I, I, would, I want to make sure that I double back and say uh, I, I omitted mentioning the 411 or KMT2A, formerly known as MLL rearranged. That is a, that is a challenging uh, subset. Uh, and that is actually a subgroup of patients where I typically am more inclined to recommend transplant. Uh, up front, even for those that achieve uh, early MRD negativity. So thanks for reminding me about that one, Jay. <laughs> I want to close this segment just by talking briefly about kind of B cell versus T cell. I think in the adult world, uh, the main difference there is that based on the French randomized trial and a lot of historical data, uh, we in, in the adult world are incorporating rituximab into induction therapy with our chemotherapy, and particularly in patients that are uh, CD20 positive, uh, although I always remember the pediatric uh, study from Austria that showed that giving steroids upregulates CD20, so you could make an argument that everybody should get uh, rituxan, um, but we don't tend to treat those uh, patients otherwise much differently, and I wanted to have Rachel comment a little bit about your approach to B versus T, because I think there are more differences in the pediatric world, as, uh, as actually, I understand. Uh, not so much. So uh, in the children's oncology group, we give our T-cell ALL patients essentially the same backbone that we give our NCI high-risk B ALL patients. 
most other consortium, pediatric consortium uh, around the world actually enroll their T and B cell patients on the same trials and give them the same uh, therapy uh, with, you know, sort of the more in intensive induction and post-induction therapy, so more aligned with their higher risk BALL patients. Um, very uh, in uh, encouragingly, though, we have been asking different questions in the children's oncology group for the last few iterations of clinical trials, and I think the nilarabine result yeah. from our AAL 0434 was incredibly exciting. You know, we've moved the T cell ALL patients into the realm of outcomes as our B cell ALL patients, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and so now we're working on incorporating nilarabine as one of our standard chemotherapy uh, agents for that for that particular disease. Um, you know, that being said, we know relapse TLL is still almost impossible to cure, and therefore we're looking for newer ways to prevent relapse in that population, so additional new agents are uh, being thought about uh, to introduce into the upfront population.